Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve. Today's video is a review of Lady Chatterley's Lover, the new Netflix film of the highly famous story born from controversy. This was fabulous. I had a great time watching it. And if that's all you wanted to know, there you have it. 4.5 out of 5 stars on Letterboxd. Watch it on December 2nd. Thank you for stopping by. Feel free to check out my latest video essay on Glass Onion, the Knives Out sequel. But if you want to stick around so we can talk about more of the details of a steamy period romance, then welcome. Let's have some fun. Just as a bit of housekeeping before I begin, Emma Corrin, the actor who portrays the titular character, Lady Chatterley, is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns as that's what's currently listed on their Instagram profile. So in this video, if I am referring to them as a performer, I will use they, them. And if I am referring to their character, Lady Chatterley, I will be using she, her. I just wanted to share that in case anyone didn't already know Emma's pronouns and also for the sake of clarity, as you listen to my feedback of the film. The first part of the video will have minimal spoilers, and then we are going to talk in a bit more detail to discuss the characters, themes, and relationships of the story. So you'll have the option of how much or how little you would like to hear before watching the film for the first time. You're not allowed to complain that I overshared if I've already told you where the line is and where not to cross if you don't want to be spoiled. Lady Chatterley's Lover is based on a book which I personally have not read, but if you do want a book recommendation from me, In Search of Enemies by John Stockwell decolonize your mind. The original book was highly controversial when it was released. All these insufferable Puritans were throwing tantrums over the more salacious content, they wanted to censor it, and in different countries the book experienced being outright banned or being put on trial for violating obscenity laws. What Puritans are too foolish to understand, though, is you saying this story is too sexy to be allowed to be available to the masses just makes all of us want to see it even more. Life comes at you fast, now doesn't it? Oh my god, this is crazy! And yes, I have a strong disdain for Puritans, not just for trying to ruin our fun of indulging in a sexy fictional romance, but also because they're religious extremists who have committed genocide on multiple occasions against indigenous people. The book is set in the early 1900s, which is the time of its original publishing. The very basic premise is that a woman gets married to a man who is a baron. Since he has a title, she becomes Lady Chatterley. He comes back from World War I injured. They move out to his estate in the countryside, and it's there that she begins an affair with a working class man who works as their gamekeeper. Thematically, that class difference is a central component of the story and dramatic conflict. There have been multiple adaptations of Lady Chatterley's lover into live action. One of the more popular ones is from the early 90s and stars Jolie Richardson and Sean Bean. Before watching the screener for this new version, I tried to see if any of the the other adaptations were readily available online, and I found one on Tubi from the early 80s, and it is by far the most unintentionally funny movie I have seen all year. It has that glowy, ethereal filter that you saw in a lot of films from the 70s, just like the Robert Redford, Mia Farrow, Great Gatsby film. They were all glowy and shiny for basically the entire runtime. But this 80s version, Let's just say it was unintentionally camp. The fact that their performances were so ridiculous, but I could tell that they thought that they were really doing that, that they were serving serious dramatic performances, made it infinitely more funny. I know they didn't film their love scenes with the intention of making me laugh so hard that I almost fell out of my chair, but is that what happened? Absolutely! Another issue I had with this version from the 80s is that the actor who portrayed Oliver Mellors, his accent was not convincing in the slightest. It sounded like when a posh actor pretends to be working class, but they just can't make it sound real. Kind of like Taron Egerton in those Tory action films. What are they called? Kingsman! Ugh. That was one of the reasons why I was confident this new adaptation would be better, at least compared to that one. Because you know who's playing the male lead in Lady Chatterley's Lover 2022? Jack O'Connell. I haven't seen Skins in years, but I remember Jack O'Connell. If he knew how to throw it down over a decade ago as a lovable teenage delinquent, I know he can do what needs to be done now as the working class romantic lead. And let me just say, after watching him as Oliver Mellors, the entire entertainment industry needs to start blowing up his phone with job offers to do more romances. Daddy? 
As for Emma Corrin, I was already familiar with them because they were in season one of Pennyworth as Esme, Alfred Pennyworth's fiance who got fridged. They were excellent in Lady Chatterley's Lover because they have a sort of challenge in the first, I would say 25 to 30% of the story where they have to convey to the audience so many repressed feelings and emotions that are compounding the more Lady Chatterley's relationship with her husband starts to fracture. But the character of Lady Chatterley, she's not verbally expressing a lot of these feelings to almost anyone. But Emma, they were so effective in communicating those layers of the character and the contrast of what's being shown externally versus what's really going on beneath the surface. In a way, it almost makes you as the viewer feel like you're being gaslit. I know that that's a strong word, but I'm not entirely sure what alternative to use that's a softer version of it where you as the viewer you can clearly see how much this woman is going through it but her husband remains completely oblivious of it though in a way that's kind of the whole crux of the issue that they have as a couple jack and emma have fantastic chemistry together the attraction and relationship of lady chatterley and her lover is something the audience needs to root for and they really had me invested in them one of the things i really like about the arc of their romance is that they did not not try to do the insta love thing. Don't get me wrong, insta love can be fun, but there's a lot of build up to how and why they find themselves in proximity to one another, why they are compatible with one another, and then of course the absolutely unreal off the charts chemistry they have. What more could you ask for? There really wasn't much that I didn't like about this. Some of the color grading seemed a bit much and on the nose, it was a lot of blue. And when they were romantically daydreaming, at one point in the story they were talking about oh well what if we ran away together we could go to Australia and I just had this knee-jerk reaction of no please don't indigenous people have had more than enough English people invading their land please leave them alone stay away from Australia all I'm saying is it took me out of the moment momentarily but then we were right back in there with the romance and the class commentary I did not expect this movie to have so much anti-capitalist commentary, but it really did. And who knew that I could have a sexy, sexy period romance and anti-capitalist messaging? Lady Chatterley's lover really said, you can have it all and we're going to give it to you. I asked one of my patrons who has read the book, what book readers might want to know about this adaptation. And they said that a lot of the adaptations just rely on the sexy, sexy times, which can reduce the story to just being smut without a story, smut without any themes being explored. This film, in my opinion, did not fall into that trap at all. There is such a rich layering of acknowledging the many ways that the intersectionality of capitalism, patriarchy, and really any ideology that forces control and order at the expense of human life, not only in the literal sense, but the death of the soul, not to be overly poetic about it, that it all collides together. This story, even though it's a period piece, it's an adaptation from a story that's roughly 100 years old, this screenplay has been reworked in such a way that it feels like it fits seamlessly into the zeitgeist of today. The commentary of the story is very easily transferable to the ways that systemic injustice and corruption and capitalism are hindrances to all of us who are just trying to live our lives, but frequently find ourselves too busy trying to work to survive while a select few who believe it's their right to oppress and exploit others for profit reap all the benefits of the system they created. The final point I will mention in my spoiler-free section, since I know people are nosy and the romance fans want to know if the salacious scenes deliver the goods. Oh yeah, they really do. I don't know who the intimacy coordinator is of this movie, but whomever choreographed these love scenes, you need to raise your booking fee. And preferably if you could work on Bridgerton and more specifically, whatever season ends up being Benedict Bridgerton season, I would be so appreciative of that. I will bake you a cake. I do not have the ingredients currently, but I will go out and buy them immediately. With your gift, 
and your talent and your vision. Are you kidding? I already know that when this movie gets its wide release, a whole lot of romance fans are going to go feral because Lady Chatterley's Lover 2022 came in, shook the table with both hands, and proved that the blessing of streaming platforms is that they can deliver what cinematic releases cannot because they're too busy trying to water everything salacious down in order to appease the puritanical terror of the MPA, which only contains continues to exist today as the death rattle of the Hayes Code. Read up on your film history if you don't know what that is, because I'm not trying to be here for another 12 hours ranting about McCarthyism. Now let's get into some more of the spoiler discussions. And again, I will reiterate, if you are choosing to proceed to this section without seeing the movie, you are not allowed to complain to me or to anyone else that I ruined it for you because I have given you the fair warning that this is the spoiler section. So feel free to stop here. You can go watch the movie when it comes out on December 2nd, and then you can come back to my review later and we can talk about all the spoilers together. I'm not entirely sure how much of this can be considered spoilers, to be quite honest, since this is a story that has been out for a century with numerous adaptations, but I still want to give all of you the option to click off if you would rather watch the film first. Whatever you prefer to do, just live your truth. First up, let's talk about the story. One of the things I found surprising about this adaptation is the way that the affair starts. As I understand it, the affair is usually something Lady Chatterley, whose name is actually Constance, but people in the film usually call her Connie or Con. So let's just call her Connie. She usually pursues this affair because she's unhappy in her marriage. In this adaptation, though, there is an extra factor added into her motivation. Her husband, Clifford, he asks her to have an affair in order to get pregnant with an heir. This opens up this whole new avenue to explore the infrastructure of high society and the norms that they live by. After he comes back from the war, he is physically disabled and seems to not have much interest in being physically intimate with Connie in any way. There's this one part where they're trying to hook up and she tries to get his hand up in her business and he just gives up and barely even tries. And I think I audibly reacted when watching this for the first time by saying something like, excuse me, do your hands and fingers not work anymore either? I'm sorry, I'm trying not to picture it. So to these upper class elites, having an heir is something important to their way of life. The way that they pass on all of this intergenerational wealth and privilege, the way that they keep their caste system in place is to follow this idea that you are inherently superior simply by being born into that life. The theme of class inequality is something I will definitely talk about more in a bit, but this detail of him asking her to have an affair in order to produce an heir and to keep it secret from him because he doesn't actually want to know the identity of the birth father is wild to me. All this talk of upper class people being so refined and superior, and they're out here being more messy than everyone else. He didn't even ask her if she wanted to have children or if she would feel comfortable being with another man outside of of their marriage. I mean, she would or else there wouldn't be a movie, but he doesn't know that. There is a noteworthy series of lines that get said at the very beginning of the movie when Clifford and Connie are first getting married. Clifford gets asked about his marriage and whether it's being done to produce an heir to Ragby. And they say to him, why else would a baronet get married? Because that's what marriage is typically seen as for these people. It's not about romance. It's not about affection. It's not about having a genuine connection and camaraderie with someone who will be your friend and partner and sure, lover, as you spend your lives together. It's about maintaining the status quo that keeps them at the top at the expense of everyone else's well-being. It's a line that might seem innocuous when you watch the film for the first time, but it's ultimately essential to introducing the very beginning of the unraveling of this marriage. Going into watching this film for the first time, I wasn't sure if they were going to be insensitive to the fact that Clifford is coming back from the war physically disabled and then his wife has an affair. But the story takes every opportunity to contextualize the many reasons that Clifford and Connie are not compatible with one another. He fails on every level to satisfy her, to give her what she needs, and it's not about him having a disability or being unable to perform. There are so many other ways that he could have made her happy and not just like that. 
The story is absolutely meticulous about fleshing out the many tendrils of how class inequality poisons people's lives and blocks them from finding happiness. And that attention to detail is what really set this romance apart from other period romance stories that I've watched. Even Bridgerton, which is a show that I've had a lot of fun watching and rewatching this year, creating videos about, it is very inept at addressing class inequality in an interesting way because that's simply not the premise they're going for. And I've called it out repeatedly, even though I have fun watching that show, for exactly that. This adaptation of Lady Chatterley's Lover doesn't just have its finger on the pulse of how capitalism and systemic oppression by the most wealthy elites destroys the lives of everyone else. It is elbow deep in unpacking those layers. I enjoyed the story so much that it is currently in my top 10 films of the year. Now, I don't know if it will stay there. I still have Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio and Avatar The Way of Water to watch, among other things that have yet to release in this final month, but it's a strong contender to stay there. It's nothing short of brilliant. Now let's talk about some of the characters. Of course, the bulk of this means talking about characters like Connie and Oliver Mellors, but as a sidebar, I do want to say that I think it's so fun that Jolie Richardson gets to be in this adaptation as Mrs. Bolton. And this is a full spoiler, full spoiler warning. Mrs. Bolton, she's a real one. And I know they play with the audience's perception a little bit where you're not really sure who she's going to side with, but in the end, she was the MVP. She sided with love over the status quo, and she outright says that this is a love story. And when she said that, I could have flown out of my chair like I was at a sports match hooting and hollering like my team just won. <laughs> now we can talk about Constance, Connie. Emma is so good in this role. I wasn't expecting to get as invested in Connie's story as I did. I just assumed I would do what I always do and side way more with the working class character that Oliver Mellors was going to be my guy because who cares about the sad rich lady? But Emma, they really surpassed any and all expectations I had. They have to emote such a wide range of emotions and undergo this transformative arc and they made me feel and get invested in the heart heartbreak of this character. They completely convinced me. The story of Connie is definitely one about female agency since a lot of what blocks her from happiness and freedom is rooted in upper class sexism. There are a lot of expectations placed on Connie because she has to abide by these respectability politics of upper society. She's a lady, she has a title, and even when Clifford is proposing that she have an affair just to get pregnant to produce an heir, he says this line to her about, you wouldn't let the wrong sort of fellow touch you. And when he said that, I said, what does that mean? And of course, we already know exactly what he means. And they circle back to that line later once he finds out about the affair and who it's with. Prove it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Emma was just so fantastic at humanizing Connie in a way that made Connie feel more relatable even though she's an upper class woman. They really made me empathize with this character and I don't think the screenplay alone could have done that as effectively if Emma hadn't done their job as well as they did. I know how difficult it must be for you to overcome all those years of upper middle class suburban oppression. <laughs> must be tough. Next, I want to quickly talk about Clifford because I want to save Oliver Mellors for last because that's my guy. And I don't want to end this section on a rant that is just full of rage, which is the only emotion I have for Clifford. The absolute audacity of this man. If this had turned into a whodunit, where the people of the town all collectively conspire to get rid of him and no one turns anyone in because they all agree to keep it hush-hush like it's Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, I would have been fine with it. I would have brought the shovel. Do you need help digging or are we doing a cremation? Because I'm not picky. <laughs> I knew that the main love story everyone would be tuning in for is between Connie and Oliver, but I really went into this trying to give Clifford a fair shot. I didn't go into the viewing hating him, but by the end, ooh, he made sure that I did, which is a credit to the actor who portrays him, obviously. The screenplay is quite interesting in how they go about it because his introduction seems harmless enough. You don't necessarily know how monstrous he is, but the story is so good at peeling back the layers one by one, so you 
you can see how it's not just about a man coming back from a war in a wheelchair and needing medical care. It's the fact that he is ridiculously wealthy, but is still forcing his wife to play nurse even though he can afford to hire people to help with that labor. It's about him being so ignorant to her emotional needs and well-being at any and every given moment. It's about him being racist to Irish people. And for those of you who are thinking, well, aren't Irish people white? How can you be racist to them? Maybe read up on a bit of history about how the English government and monarchy and landlords have been to the Irish people for centuries, and then you won't need to ask me such obvious questions. It's about Clifford being a prime example of scummy, wealthy, capitalist, tech oligarchs. Homicide. The whole mining subplot ended up being far more interesting than I would have anticipated when it was first introduced into the story. So Connie is visiting the village and encounters some miners who are going on strike, but they are miners from a different village because they can't even strike in their own village or else they risk losing their job. And then when word gets out that workers are leaving their own mine because it seems like there isn't much coal to be extracted, freaking Clifford decides that that's the perfect opportunity for him to play savior in his own mind by becoming a majority owner or whatever the position is of the mine and help them to industrialize. But of course, that's not actually beneficial to anyone but himself and his profits. The workers are still being ridiculously underpaid. The equipment is dangerous and he just doesn't care. <laughs> Clifford is the worst. He can eat dirt. I wish him nothing but terrible things. Now, this is no hate to the actor who portrays him, of course. He's just doing his job and doing it very well. But I do have to give it up to the screenplay for being so thorough in communicating that he is completely irredeemable, as is every rich aristocrat who is content to unquestioningly go along with the status quo, even when your wife calls you out for your lack of empathy and you refuse to listen. Now, let me talk about Oliver Mellers. Jack O'Connell, the man that you are. If I don't see more demands for him to do more romances after this, then what was all of it for? Why are you so romantic? There's a moment between Oliver and Connie where she tells him that he has tenderness. And I think that is such a perfect way of summing up why he is such an appealing romantic lead in this. It can sometimes be risky to tune in for these class difference period romances. You kind of have to brace yourself for there to be something weird and fetishistic about an upper class woman wanting to be with a working class man in pursuit of something because it's forbidden or because he's going to physically handle himself or her in a way that's more... I don't know, just something that comes across more like a stereotype. But because this is such a deeply anti-capitalist love story, the upper class world and the upper class characters are associated with being cold and devoid of empathy. How can you be an appealing romantic partner when you are devoid of empathy? If you only care about the well-being of a select few over the well-being of many, then why should I, as the viewer, root for you to be the end game of the love story? I think that's also why Oliver is so closely associated with nature. He has a pet dog. He tends to and cares for the animals. And if you care about the earth, about animals, and about people, then that deep capacity for empathy is going to make you an attractive romantic lead. There are also many characteristics that both Connie and Oliver have that are similar to one another, which further communicates that it makes all the sense in the world that they would fall in love with one another. Lady Chatterley. Sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. Do you want to come in? Now is probably the right time to move into discussing more about the relationships within this love triangle. I really appreciated the structure of how they shattered the relationship between Connie and Clifford because they spend the entire film showing you a long list of all the ways that he is terrible to her and just terrible in general. He's emotionally manipulative. He neglects her. He forces her to perform labor like a nurse, but his fragile rich man ego makes him drag his feet about hiring a nurse to care for him. And the most damning evidence of all, his rapidly escalating escalating disdain for the working class. What this ultimately exposes is how fundamentally different Connie and Clifford are to the point of it making them incompatible. These two people have completely different values and outlooks on life. This man outright said that life is about accepting the nothingness of life. Oh my God, I'm gonna hang myself by the Janimals if you don't stop talking. He thinks himself superior to everyone else, that he is entitled to live far above others because he was born and raised to do so. It's 
it's giving monarchy energy and i just really think that connie should have pulled a diary of a mad black woman the scene with the bathtub i'm not elaborating on that but you can look it up if you don't understand the reference <laughs> I can't swim. Even when he asked her to have an affair, but then he went and threw a temper tantrum over the Irish playwright flirting with her. Make up your mind, you pasty worm. But all this to say that when Connie gives her big breaking up with you speech, it feels completely earned because you've just spent the last two hours of him committing one infraction after another. So you are able to recall all of the evidence that backs up her case of why she wants a divorce. And not to mention, this man just never listens. He's out here trying to boo-hoo, just talk to me, Connie, so I can understand, blah, blah, blah. As if she hasn't been trying to communicate with him for their entire marriage, and none of it was clicking because he's not here to listen to anything except the sound of his own voice. He really does embody that stereotype that I see sometimes making the rounds on social media of claiming that there's a very particular type of straight man that is not actually looking for a wife they're just looking for a mother so that they can keep living their life as the baby being pampered when mrs bolton says she's going to go out and look for connie since clifford's throwing a tantrum he freaks out about the idea of mrs bolton leaving him alone now she babies him because she is a professional working woman doing her job but my job as a viewer and reviewer is to judge and emote and my emotions were telling me to throw him into a volcano i'm not sure where i would find a volcano in the Midlands, but that's a concern for another day. Now let's talk about Connie and Oliver and not just the steamy parts. One of the things I love is how gradual and natural the development of their relationship is. That one moment earlier in the movie where he helps to push Clifford and after he walks off, she just kind of looks back at him, perhaps curious or intrigued. Also the fact that when she first goes to visit him, she was not the one seeking him out. Clifford had asked her to go visit him to ask about the birds. And when we get to the iconic scene with the baby chicks and she starts breaking down, the hug, that nearly blew my wig off because it's such a revealing moment for these characters on an emotional level. You can really feel how incredibly lonely Connie is and how much that is taking a toll on her. And the way that he initially keeps his arms out of just not touching her because he's really not supposed to be getting up close and personal with her as the wife of his employer or just as any upper class woman for that matter. And then he says, so that's how it's been, eh? And he hugs her back because he's not emotionally stunted like Clifford. He can very clearly figure out that something is bothering her and that she needs a hug. She needs someone to just make sure she can sit and decompress until, of course, she escalates things to a whole other level, which is probably a perfect transition to talking about the physically intimate scenes of this movie. There is a lot to praise in how these scenes were choreographed and designed for one, the first time they get together, she's the one to initiate it. He hesitates instead of immediately jumping on her. And during this interaction, they don't kiss. Then when she comes to visit him the second time, she is the one to kiss him. And that hookup was a lot to watch because they made the choice to not have any music playing. So all you hear is them, they're breathing, they're rustling, the little things that they're saying to each other. Who knew that Jack O'Connell only needed three little words to immortalize himself into the Romance Hall of Fame? Look at me. It's my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, me too. They were so wrong to keep playing that audio in her fantasy sequences. I mean, really? Can you let us breathe? Oh, and speaking of being breathless, that brings us to another hookup scene in the woods. She communicates to him how she wants to be treated. Now, I've talked about this before in some of my Bridgerton videos, but there is often this tendency for men in romance stories to be toxic cavemen. But in this scene, the only reason he starts to handle her in the way that he does is because she explicitly asked him to. The physical intimacy between these two characters would not be anywhere near as effective as it is if they didn't do as well as they do, conveying the building and escalating emotional intimacy between them. Because regardless of this idea that they're from different worlds, different classes, they are the same. 
They're both passionate, caring people who are trapped in loveless marriages with greedy, selfish people. And on a lighter note, the first time she calls him Oliver instead of using his surname, I truly ascended because of how cute it was. Finally, I want to talk a bit about the ending. I loved how realistic it was. It was a happy ending, but it didn't gloss over the very real fallout that would come from them both conducting themselves in the way that they did. He lost his job at rugby and he had to leave her in order to find a new job and get things set up so that he would be able to have something material to provide for both her and their baby. And all of the bad things they said would happen to Connie if word got out about her affair did in fact happen. She was shunned. People whom she once called friends turned their back on her. She received dirty, judgmental looks. People gossiped about her very unsubtly. She was considered by her upper class peers to be a disgrace. But that's ultimately why the ending feels so satisfying. Because people who believe in this caste system, people who uphold capitalism instead of fighting back against it, who cares about having their approval? Love who you want to love. And also... You are not going to tell me that a life out in the beautiful Scottish countryside is supposed to be a loss by any means. You mean to tell me if you had a hot person who deeply, deeply loved you, was waiting for you in Scotland, that you wouldn't book a one-way flight? How does it feel to be a liar? And Jack's entire monologue in the letter that Oliver Mellors wrote, it was just so beautiful. It was so moving. I kid you not. I cried when we got to the end of the movie because it was just so satisfying emotionally to finally see them get to be together. And them being together is not just about the love story on its own. There's this added weight to the payoff because of all the anti-capitalist commentary. It makes you feel like you can overcome these corrupt, oppressive systems to find love and happiness. And I'm not sure how coherent this review was, but I am very much basking in the afterglow of it all. So if you decided to spoil everything for yourself by making it this far without watching, just make sure that you still tune in December 2nd on Netflix. It was was very good. And one other detail that I really liked that I still want to share that I forgot to mention while I was going through and comparing and contrasting the characters and relationships is that I really appreciated that one scene where it was so awkward and uncomfortable and tense, but I appreciated the tension because of what it means for the larger story and uh, character arcs as they're progressing. There's often this emphasis on Clifford being physically disabled, but in that moment, Oliver is struggling because he also has a physical ailment from being in war. It was the fact that he had problems with his lungs, so him having to inhale all this smoke and overexerting himself in the way that he was for the sake of Clifford, and Clifford not caring about any of that once Connie points it out to him later on when they're having a fight about it, that was such a crucial moment of really understanding all of these characters, who they are and where they're at in the larger character arcs that we're seeing play out, as well as the larger commentary of the story. Not to mention there's this one speech that Oliver has where he's talking about how all rich people or all these upper class people, he calls them dead because he's specifically referring to how these people have to turn off a part of themselves that would feel bad about sending people into mines, into factories, and into war. And in that moment, when I was watching him deliver this monologue, I just couldn't help but feel like, did Lady Chatterley's lover just call out the military industrial complex? Thank you to all of you who have watched my review and an extra thank you to everyone who has tuned in to my Glass Onion review. I wasn't sure how well that video was going to perform since I know that not everyone has been able to see it so they want to wait until the December release to come back and listen to me discuss it in the level of detail that I do. But between Glass Onion and Lady Chatterley's lover and also The Menu, which is another film that I did a review on, we are truly living in an abundance of quality anti-capitalist eat the rich art. Not just for the messaging, but also for the entertainment value. I love it. I'm being fed some great movies. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to help a small creator like myself to grow. Next up will be a review of Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which I also have a screener of. I've been very hungry to watch it, but I have not been able to do so yet because I was working on this review. And I was also seeing Glass Onion a couple more times while I still have the chance to do so. At the cinema, no less. See you in the next one. Bye.